Thank you for your very warm and generous welcome. It's great. It's a, it is a real pleasure to be with you. And uh, you know, to follow after two wonderful speakers, and wow, it's great to be able to build on what they've, they've laid down. Let's pray. Our great God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are infinite, eternal and unchangeable. We thank you that you are omnipotent, that you are sovereign. And Father, we do pray that as we consider this topic of revival, that we may know that we rely on he who has created all things and sustains all all things. Father, we pray that you would stir us up, that we may, may seek your face and that you may pour out your spirit, that we may see your kingdom extended and above all, to see your name honoured and glorified. All the glory belongs to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I just want to quickly start with just looking a little bit at uh, Romans chapter 12, just as, to set something that I'm going to be mentioning in my uh, presentation. And so we're dealing with the latter part and I'll go to the end of chapter 11. And Paul there says, exclaims, that he's been talking about the mystery of the fact of um, election. And then he says... In verse 33, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable are his ways! For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counsellor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is, the good, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And we're going to just leave it there. He goes on to talk about the fact that God gives us gifts and he blesses us, but that we are part of a body and that we have a role and a function in the body of Christ. And it's not about us as individuals, but it's about us contributing and functioning in the body of Christ. And this is so important. I want to point out that when he says to them, he says, do not be conformed, in verse 2, to this world. This is so important as Christians that we need to appreciate that we need to be on watch because it is easy to be conformed to this world. Now another interpretation of the Greek can be do not be or do not be conformed or transformed to the spirit of this age. Um, J.B. Phillips, in his translation, says he can says that the word used there can be looked to being something like "do not be moulded by this world." And then he goes on. Paul says, "But be transformed by the renewing of your mind." And it's through the power of the Holy Spirit that this renewal occurs. And the Greek word. It, for transformed is the a Greek word uh, metamorphizo, right? Which means the metamorphosis, but the actual English translation is transfigured. 
It is the actual word that we see in the Gospels when it's talking about the transfiguration of Christ. So in one way, we need to look at it as the fact that we, who are believers, are filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay? We are te individually temples of the living God. And Paul talks about that. And so in a sense, it's like, let the Spirit shine forth. Let that dominate you and not what the world is trying to impose upon you. Now, the reason why I'm presenting this is because we're going to see a change in the evangelical church and world in Australia in this second part of looking at history of Australian revivals. And I also want to uh, mention at the end of 1 John chapter 5, and there he talks about, he's, where he says about the little children. He says, little children, this is verse 21, keep yourselves from idols. And it's so easy to create idols. We, by nature, create idols. We can make an idol of anything. It could be even your, your, your husband or your wife, your children... An idol is anything that takes the place that God should have. And we constantly need to be looking out for idols. You can make the ministry an idol. You can even make the historic topic of revival an idol. We need to be aware. And the lovely passage that we heard about Ephesus, there extraordinary revival that happened there in Acts. It's interesting that it continues on and it talks about the fact that the silversmiths end up going to like the magistrate and protesting because of what Paul is doing. He's turning everything upside down. Why? His business is suffering. Because we read about what was happening. All those books that were burned. Radical transformation of lives. And they're going, you know, Artemis, we're the city of Artemis. And they want something done about that. That's because Paul had the gift of discerning idols. And then he also not only discerned them, he exposed the idols. And then through the power of the gospel, he destroyed idols. So we as Christians need to be discerning. Um, could I, we just have the intro slide for session two up? Thank you. Now, last night I mentioned I sort of really stopped at uh, 1870s, uh, even though I said I was going to the, to the end of the 19th century. But what is interesting is that as time proceeded, many revivals, sorry, I actually didn't do what I said I was going to do, start, it started. So I'll just make sure five minutes, I'll take five minutes off. Um, I'm, I'm elderly, so you've got to be um, mindful and excuse me. So as time proceeded, many revivals revolved around gifted evangelists and we see this big influx from about 1870. It occurs a little bit before that, but a real big influx occurs from about 1870 into Australia. And they were gifted men and, and godly men, but they employed new measures. So in other words, they're influenced by this guy, Charles Finney, who we heard about last night in the panel session... And Charles Finney was a Presbyterian, but he, he wasn't a true Calvinistic Presbyterian, and the Presbyterians really didn't want him. Um, and look, you know, th this guy had a heart for God, and um, I don't want to totally discredit what he did, but unfortunately, he basically said, you can create revival. And so he put out a book called Revival Lectures, and he basically gives the formula of being able to create a revival. Now, he was a very gifted speaker. He had trained as a lawyer, so he, he had that gift. And he used that. He was so persuasive. 
but he also talked about creating an atmosphere, orchestrating a revival. And so he came up with a kind of methodology. And subsequently, a lot within the USA took hold of this and slowly started using it. And as a result of that, we see that the, the nature of evangelism changes. Is, it's a subtle move. Okay? Slowly. I talked about being, not being conformed to the spirit of the world or the spirit of the age. And his methods were replicating a lot of the change that was going on in the USA. And the whole movement towards, and it continued to develop, of the whole idea of marketing and taking that worldly approach to the presentation of the gospel. And so he created these new measures. There was a, a bit of a debate amongst the good Calvinists and God raised up a wonderful evangelist by the name of Asahal Nettleton. Great guy and, and it's a, a lovely book about him. Exciting stuff to read about the way God used him in revival. So we see that a change comes in. As I mentioned, these can be uh, traced to the influence of Charles Finney. And a paradigm shift in means, methods and methodology and even theological perspective occurred as a consequence. From, seven, uh, from 1870 on, Australia experienced the new approach to evangelistic campaigns which were often spoken of in terms of revival campaigns. The influence of D.L. Moody and his ministry was particularly strong. Again, an extraordinary evangelist, a good friend of C.H. Spurgeon's. And it's worth reading his ministry. Great stuff and some wonderful quotes. Godly man. But he imbibed these new measures. And so it really affected the nature of evangelism in the later 1800s. This influence we see in 1874. There was an article in the South Australian newspaper called Border Watch on revivals of religion. And there's a, a report of a local lecture on modern revival. This is the title, Modern Revivalism. Is it from heaven or of men? The subject was treated by comparing the conversions recorded in the New Testament with those of modern revivalism. And even a, a, a wonderful guy, which we heard about yesterday, and uh, Tom quoted from him, because there's some fantastic quotes that he has, and that is William G. Taylor, this Australian minister, Methodist evangelist, and even he, when he was sent to a hard gig in Sydney, a hard church area, and he employed bar, brass bands in the street, and he, and he produced leaflets in bright pink in order to... So he slowly was taking on these methods. Now, I'm not saying they're totally wrong, but there is a, there, there's just this subtle shift occurring. So we see that. And the first overseas evangelists to employ these modern methods, these new measures, in Australia was this, unfortunately, Presbyterian... Alexander Somerville, Scotsman, and a great, a great guy, good preacher, and a wonderful evangelist. And he had worked with Moody and Sankey during the, uh, the Glasgow uh, mission in 1874. And so he came to Australia in 1877 and conducted uh, missions in Victoria, New South Wales, Queensland and Tasmania. His Australian campaign employed many methods used by Moody. Somerville used interdenominational support and a united evangelistic committee. And they were used particularly in Sydney and in Melbourne. 
These committees included representatives from many denominations. And so a united evangelistic choir was created and they used Sankey's sacred songs, which I actually remember just after being converted, I attended a open brethren, Christian brethren church, and we used Sankey's. So I got a soft spot for Sankey's hymnal. Now, in 1894, the Reverend John McNeil, another Scotsman, he was known as the Scottish Spurgeon, right? So he, was, he had, had a reputation, this man, and he came to Australia on another evangelistic campaign. And again, it was extraordinary the, the measures, these new methods that he was employing that in fact it led uh, a journalist to comment about it. And so we see this shift occurring. And that now brings us to the period that I am focusing on, and that is revivals from the 1900 to the present. So we go into the new century, 1900. Australia becomes a nation, 1901. And it's interesting, at that time, in the nation, they realise that we need an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so there was extraordinary prayer. And I'll talk about that the campaign which occurred with R.A. Torrey and uh, uh, his uh, musician Alexander. But before I get there, I've just personally, just again, now we heard about the, the 96 recorded, and there's, pro there's, there's probably a few more that's, that are not recorded, of revivals in Australia from about 1830 to close to 1900. But I just want to quickly list, I don't have a slide for this, but I'll just quickly read out some, and this is just a, a drop in the bucket, of revivals that have occurred from 1900 towards the present. So, 1901 slash 1902, what's called the Simultaneous Mission. 1905, Redfern, New South Wales. Uh, Bowden, South Australia. 1906, Ferrymead, Queensland. 1909, 1912, the Chapman and Alexander Missions. 1923 to 1924, Sheffield, Tasmania. 1931 to 33, Wynyard, Tasmania. 1962, Thornley, New South Wales. 1953, and across the nation with Alan Walker's Mission to the Nation. 1965, 67, Cronulla, New South Wales. Uh, 1968, 69, Billy Graham Crusade, 1969, Wendina, New, uh, South Australia, 1979 to the 1980s, extraordinary lengthy period, Echo Island is amongst the Aboriginals, extraordinary revival, Echo Island, Armin Land, 19, uh, sorry, 2000 to about 2004, Hobart, and that's just, just a, a list, and I... Um, I really want to highlight that revival is a part of Australian church history. So that brings us to the 1901-1902. There was a realisation, as I said, that we needed revival in this land and we're a new nation now. So they're now thinking, this nation needs revival. And so there was a desire on the heart of a godly, godly man who died tragically up in Queensland, uh, another John McNeil, but spelt differently. And he had a heart for revival. And he and a handful of men in 1889 decided that they were going to covenant together to pray for the outpouring of revival across the land of Australia. From, and so they prayed continuously from that date for this wonderful outpouring of revival. And as a result of this small group, there arose across Australia countless 
prayer bands, as they call them, given over to pray for revival. And there was such a desire amongst many ministers around Australia that they agreed to send a petition to D.L. Moody to come and to preach in Australia, to have a mission campaign. Now, sadly, um, in 1899, when this came to Moody, and he was contemplating it, sadly, he passed away. But fortunately for uh, Australia, the person that he had running his Bible college, Reuben Torrey, R.A. Torrey, agreed to step out of that role for a time and to come to Australia to preach the gospel. And following Moody's methods, he got a a young guy, but a gifted young man uh, called Alexander, was his surname, and he was going to be his sidekick to do the music side of the ministry. Um, And as I mentioned, D.L. Moody had Sankey. So he was following this model. And he agreed to come to Australia. So the large company of prayer unions now had a specific person to pray for. It's correct to say that that mission of Torrey and Alexander was soaked in prayer. In Melbourne alone, at the start of the mission, there were 16,000 prayer meetings for the mission. And these prayer meetings were attended by a total of 117,000 people. Wow! The population at that time of Victoria, total population, was one million. The total population of Melbourne at the time was 500,000. So truly extraordinary. And they also made it their mission to knock on the door of each house in Melbourne and visit them at least twice before we had Torrey come. All the houses, all the doors, twice, they were that committed to this work. So when Torrey came, he went first to Sydney and then went to Melbourne and he evangelised in Melbourne, 50 suburbs were evangelised simultaneously. So as he preached in the heart of Melbourne, all the different suburbs, so 50 in total, had evangelists and gifted uh, preachers who had an evangelistic gift, went and and conducted in the halls, uh, in in theatres and in public spaces, they conducted evangelistic meetings as Torrey was speaking in the heart of Melbourne. They actually had 30 large tents that they used to also assist where they couldn't get appropriate halls. And so, extraordinary crowds. Okay, can we just have a slide, please? So there is distinguished R.A. Torrey and Charles Alexander. These are the two people we're talking about who God used at this mission. Okay. So, what happens in Melbourne? The mission went for four weeks in Melbourne and each week around 250,000 people attended the meetings. What's the population of Melbourne? 500,000. Two, and this for four weeks. Average each week, 250,000 tended. Extraordinary. 860, uh, sorry, 8,642 made professions of faith. And the terminology for conversion starts to change. Just notice 
the subtle change that we have. So now we have them as professions of faith. It's going to change later. We had such wonderful success. Can I tell you what was very interesting is that so powerful was the move of the Spirit in that broad Melbourne district that a song that was used by Alexander, and actually Alexander was given this song, and when he was given it, he thought, oh, this is a dud, it's not going to work. But then he thought, okay, I'm going to a new place, I need this, a new song. And so he employed what's, what's been called the, glor- the glory song. Now, the tune's pretty hopeless, so I'm not going to try and sing it, but I'm going to read to the lyrics. Now, the reason why it's important to, to just be aware of it is that everywhere you went around in Melbourne, whether you're going on trams or whether you're walking down the street, you heard this tune everywhere. People were singing it. Okay? This was a top, massive hit. It became so famous it was known around the world and particularly because of it being used in Australia and the report of this extraordinary revival. In fact, they claim that this 1902 revival was the biggest revival ever in the world. Now, it's probably exaggerated. That's what good advertising can do. I watched Gruen transfer. Um, And so, this is the song. When all my labours and trials are o'er, and I'm safe on the beautiful shore, just to be near the dear Lord I adore, will through the ages be glory for me. And the chorus, oh, that will be glory for me, glory for me, glory for me. When his grace I shall look on his face, that will be glory, be glory for me. Verse 2, when by the gift of his infinite grace, I am accorded in heaven a place, just to be there and to look on his face, will through the ages be glory to me. And then the chorus, and then verse 3. Friends will be there I have loved long ago, Joy like a river around me will flow. Yet just a smile from my Saviour I know will through the ages be glory for me. Glory for me, glory for me. Chorus. Extraordinary. That's not bad. It says some lovely things, some beautiful things. But not an overly extraordinary song. But it had an impact. It captivated Australia. I talked about Melbourne. It wasn't restricted to Melbourne because um, Torrey goes back to Sydney, extraordinary campaign in New South Wales. And that campaign started in 1901. Before he arrived, they were going to all the different country towns and they experienced that glorious revival there in the Sydney district and beyond. And it was so extensive that they covered at least 200 towns had these evangelistic missions occur. And in fact, there were approximately well over 200, 240,000 who gave professions of faith in New South Wales. That's how extensive it was. And then Torrey and Alexander went to Tasmania. Now, Tasmania, a very small population at the time. And uh, to give you an idea, Launceston had 18,000. Hobart had 50 to 60,000. The total population of Australia at the time was 4 million. And they started in Launceston. And there was an extraordinary outpouring of the Holy Spirit there. Wonderful. Huge numbers for that small population attended. And many, again, professions of faith. And so they quickly said this was an extraordinary revival. And then he moves down to Hobart 
and the stories. I could read to you letters at the time, accounts uh, that appeared in the, the local newspapers of these wonderful things. And what was interesting with them, and can we have the next slide? Okay, this is just to give you an idea of the Melbourne Town Hall. That's, they, they tended to have a range of different types of meetings. They would have men's meetings, they would have women's meetings, they would have children's meetings, and then they'd have just a combined, you know, men, women, children, combined meetings. That's just a picture of a daytime men's meeting. And some of these men's meetings were purely prayer meetings. And they were packed out like that. Well, in Hobart, they had huge trouble trying to accommodate the crowds that were coming. People had to be turned away and sent to one of the other big halls that they had. And there they'd have Alexander taking over the role of preacher for that breakout group. So massive crowds. In fact, the big Methodist church in Melville Street, which was modelled after Wesley's own church, it, they, had to, they had to build a new gallery to accommodate the crowds. And they literally crowded. And they actually went all the way down the street and around the block to wait. And this is, you know, the, the men were in, the women were waiting, and they were waiting in, that, in those big queues just to get in. And also, children. And, and, and I'm not going to read the account because I end up crying when I read it. But there, this is, this is Hobart, 2,500 children at a meeting. And children were just bathed in tears because of Christ. Their hearts were touched by the gospel. So, a third of the, of the population of Launceston attended the crusade. One quarter of the population of Hobart attended the crusade. They were speaking of these two as true revivals. And the fruits lingered. A couple of women who were so touched that they paid to have Torrey's sermons published in the local newspaper, which still exists, called The Mercury. Each week they had a sermon of Torrey, and that went for years that they paid to have these sermons. Extraordinary work. So this is a revival. Unfortunately, they didn't come up to um, Queensland. But you'll have experienced another great revival that occurred. Can we just have another slide, please? Okay. So, after this wonderful revival... And in fact, we actually had a missionary send her daughter from India down to Tasmania and to the mainland in uh, 1903 because of the renown of this wonderful revival in Australia. Her name was Pandita Rambabai. And she sent her daughter in order to obtain information about this revival what can we do that we may experience revival? Well, it's interesting. On her daughter's return not long after, there's an extraordinary uh, revival that has occurred and it's been well documented. Now, this revival predates the Welsh revival of 1904-1905. We need to remember this. After that, we end up having, Torrey didn't return, but we had Alexander come, and this time he teamed up with this gentleman, Wilbur Chapman. And so they came to Australia and engaged in some campaigns. And they, were, they were well attended, and, you, and probably rightly so, to, to talk about them having uh, been involved in revival. But they were good and godly men. So we had 
two mission tours uh, by these gentlemen, Alexander and Chapman, called the Chapman. And there's a quote from him. It's not a bad quote, is it? And we have a number of revivals, but also at this time we have the matter of, just checking my time, uh, we have the matter of Pentecostalism. And Pentecostalism became a big deal and they experienced revivals. But I'm not going to account for them. They're also well document, documented. I think there's a fair mention of those in the books that you've all received in that, in that uh, bag that you've got. And so I'm going to have to, because time's racing, I'm going to go then to another biggie, which I didn't include in that listing that I mentioned. And that is Billy Graham, 1959. Australia, again, felt a great need for revival. And after the war, things and worldliness was really becoming a part of Australian life. We're starting now to become more affluent. War's over. Bit of prosperity. And, but the churches realised that they needed to see some work of God. And so they called over to Billy Graham and he agreed to come. And he held 114 meetings in 106 days. This tour became known as the greatest moment of revival history in our nation, according to many. To this day, I often meet men and women, elderly, who were saved in the Billy Graham crusade of 59. And these, many of these, are serving the Lord still, and many of them were in the ministry. In leading up to this rally, over 40,000 individuals signed up to pray for the event. In Sydney, about 600 to 650 churches worked together to door knock around 400,000 homes with a spiritual survey. Interesting, the use of spiritual surveys. Over 8,000 counsellors were employed, uh, 45,000 nationally. And these were trained to help these new decision makers. In Sydney, 150,000 people turned up on the last night. So can we have a, a couple of... Next slide, please. Okay. As I mean, uh, we're going to see... I'll, I'll move to Melbourne. But that just gives you a picture of the Maya Music Bowl in Melbourne. Could you go to the, to the next one, please? Okay. So here we have the MCG. I'll talk about this in a minute when I get there. And can I have the next one? Okay, Sydney Cricket Ground. Uh, you can see up there, and then you've also got the Sydney Showground. That last session had 150,000 people turn up. Massive. Massive. And over, over the time in that Sydney area, 56,000 decisions for Christ were made. And so we're moving away from conversions, professions of faith, and now we have decisions. Some churches reported 75% to 94% retention rates. So did Australia experience a revival in 1959? Well, over 3 million people attended the Billy Graham Crusades across Australia and included Queensland. It occurred up here with great numbers. And that is about a third of the population of Australia attended the Billy Graham Crusade. In 1959, the total population was 10 million. The MCG, by the way, can we, can we go back to the MCG? I think it's there. Okay, there we are, MCG. You know, the biggest crowd ever at the MCG was not Don Bradman playing cricket there. It wasn't some weird 
AFL, VFL match. And it wasn't Taylor Swift. It was the Billy Graham crusade. To this very day, it has the biggest record of a crowd. 143,750. 1959, population of Australia, 10 million. In Tasmania, Launceston, as I mentioned, a third, Hobart, a quarter, attended the Billy Graham crusade. There was this real hope and prayer for revival and it occurred under Billy Graham. But we start to see these shifts. It's no longer, even though churches are involved and there's united prayer and oh, they're all wonderful things, it's now about an organisation and this machine and with the, these new measures. And so we see these shifts occurring. And yes, it was successful. But it's interesting that Billy Graham came back twice after that and never was able to replicate what occurred. But we do find the fact that there was the expectation of revival for this event. There was unprecedented unity. There was extraordinary prayer. And the church was revitalised. There were increased number of churchgoers, increased number of theological students, and many of the, the theological colleges recount how they saw these increased numbers. And there was an increased number of missionaries raised up. There was an increased number of people reading the Bible. Scripture Union kept a tally. So their tally, March uh, 1958, they had 58,000 nationally. And by the end of November 1959, they had 104,400 Okay, in the space of months, it more than or close, close to doubled. Following the Sydney Crusade, 833 Bible study groups were established in the Sydney CBD. Increase in laity taking up the responsibility of evangelism. As I said, large numbers converted, 150,000 decisions, with a good percentage continuing in the faith. And there was a reduction of sinful practices in the wider community, which we heard about. It's great that that was... So I don't have to go into detail about that. And a number of people at, at the time wrote concerning these revivals. And I'll... You know, I'll just read uh, just one or two. So this is a, the minister at St Stephen's Presbyterian. Sydney is a pleasure-loving city. Its people have been described as amiable pagans. Its church people have always had a struggle and too often have been weak and defeated. What a difference there is now. There is a spirit of gaiety and confidence amongst the church people. Morale is an all-time high and all the city is talking religion and the churches, working joyfully together, feel a new strength. We believe it is the beginning of the first big revival in our history. God has done great things. There, wherefore, we are glad. And my time is up. Just quickly, I just want to quickly mention uh, that there was the Jesus People movement in the 1970s. And I'm, going to, I'm mentioning that. And there, were, and there was revival around that here in Australia. Now, I mention it because in, in some weird way, I'm a bit of a product of that. I remember it was 1974, I was 15, just turned 15, and I went to a government school and I overheard some Christians, some seniors, talking about Jesus Christ and things like that. And just, I overheard and was fascinated about this stuff. I was not from a Christian family. 
And, but we weren't anti-God, but we, just, we weren't Christian. And so as a result of hearing them, and my brother, one of my brothers was a senior, they gave some tracks to. And he, you know, he liked these guys. These guys were cool. They had long hair. And so he took the books and he put them on the shelf and we shared a bedroom. And I said to him after a few days, look, Peter, you're not reading those, are you? I said, can I read them? And so I, I read these tracks. And so I, I, I had a, a Bible and I, went, I hid under my bed okay, and started reading the Bible so I wouldn't be laughed at by my family. And I gave my heart to Christ. And so at that time, there was all this influence of the Jesus people and though, in a sense, I wasn't directly part of it, there was something in the air. I saw so much going on spiritually and extraordinary. All around, there was this spirit movie. And I didn't realise at the time, what was really interesting, and I'm going to conclude now, I went to my first church service. I, it was extraordinary. I had this dream and I dreamt that my mum, you know, asked, asked me questions and I, I answered them to mum. And the next day, mum says to me, Damien, you've changed, what's going on? And I said, oh, I've become a Christian, mum. And you know what, mum? I dreamt this last night. And I shared with her what I was asked to share in that dream. She cried, gave her heart to Christ. She's passed away, but was a strong Christian to her dying breath. My eldest brother, and he's uh, six years older than me, so I'm 65, because, you know, he's getting quite old. And he said to me, again, that same dream, same night, and then he asked me, he said, Damien, you've changed, what's going on? I said, I dreamt this. I shared the gospel. And he became a Christian. So the two of us, unchurch, I said, these guys who I overheard, they went to this Christian brethren, I found it went to a Christian brethren church, not far away. So we went there. And this is why I'm concluding with this. The first message I heard was a sermon on revival. But the funny thing was, I thought, why is he preaching that? I was so aflamed for God. I was so on fire. My world had changed. I thought, isn't everyone on fire for God? Older, wiser, it was an appropriate message. God was moving. God was working. And as I mentioned last night, providence is our diary. I can look back and realise there was revival. But at the time, we needed to hear that message of revival. Now, unfortunately, there's so much more I could talk about, but time doesn't permit. But thank you for your patience. I'll just close in prayer. Oh, dear Lord and God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how your word stirs up our hearts. And Father, we thank you that it's the gospel that sets us aflame. It is the work of your Holy Spirit, changing a heart, making it beat after you. And Father, can do no other but turn to you, seek you, cling to you, cling to the cross of Jesus Christ and look to him and his perfect obedience as our robe of righteousness and his efficacious sacrifice on the, clock, uh, on the cross uh, for us, the shedding of his blood for the remission of our sins, that we can stand before you, God, and we can say, Abba, Father, we are adopted children of God. Father, we pray that we may see people all around us experiencing this joy, having eyes open and not looking to the world for fulfilment, which is shallow. But they may find eternal joy, peace and contentment in the eternal, unchangeable God 
and our Saviour, Jesus Christ.